the age of devolution. This is about more than our politics and our laws. This is about who we are, how we carry ourselves. 25 years of the Scottish Parliament, what difference has it made? We've done more in five times five years than we would have done in five times 25 years at Westminster. There hasn't been enough imagination in, in policy making. When you think about the Parliament's 25 year history, for me, the early albums were the best. May 1999 saw the first ever election to a parliament which has changed the nation forever. Over the past 25 years, we've had seven first ministers and 349 MSPs. Together, they've passed 356 bills. Tonight, we'll be reflecting on the anniversary with a panel of guests. Ahead of that, STV's political correspondent Ewan Petrie is your guide as we remember some of the sights and sounds from a quarter of a century of politics. And there's some flash photography throughout this film. Donald Dewar is duly elected to serve as a member of the Scottish Parliament for Glasgow and his land. The first six words of the Scotland Act read simply, there shall be a Scottish Parliament, and with those six simple words, Scottish politics are forever changed. May 1999 marked a new beginning for Scottish politics. <laughs> Two years after Labour swept to power in a landslide at Westminster, Voters here elected the first Scottish Parliament in almost three centuries. The Scottish Parliament adjourned on the 25th day of March in the year 1707 is hereby reconvened. Decision-making had been brought closer to home. The question now facing the nation's new MSPs was what to do with it. Morning, Almost immediately, Labour and the Liberal Democrats began talks over a coalition. We'll have to see how we get on, but, you know, we want it to work, but, you know, we may, have, we may not, but we'll, we'll give it our best shot. They signed a deal ushering in an era of a new type of politics. Jim and myself can confirm that agreement has been reached between Labour and the Liber Liberal Democrat groups in the Scottish Parliament. This historic agreement will ensure that Scotland's first parliament for 300 years will make a difference for all of the people of Scotland. In July, the Queen officially opened the new Parliament. It is a moment rare in the life of any nation when we step across the threshold of a new constitutional age. We are fallible. We all know that. We'll make mistakes. But I hope and I believe we will never lose sight of what brought us here, the striving to do right by the people of Scotland, to respect their priorities, to better their lot and to contribute to the common wheel. Then it was time for the work to begin. In their temporary home here in the Mound, MSPs wasted little time using their newly devolved powers. After months of bruising debate, they scrapped the controversial Section 28 law, which prohibited the promotion of homosexuality in schools. They abolished upfront tuition fees, replacing them with a graduate endowment. But then, with the Parliament still in its infancy, there came a tragedy whose impact was felt far beyond the world of politics. It's with deep sadness I have to report that Scotland's First Minister, uh, Donald Dewar, has died. This is a sad day for Scotland. Scotland has lost a great man. The death of Donald Dewar from a brain hemorrhage led to a flood of tributes for a man described as the father of devolution. In the leadership race which followed, Henry McLeish defeated Jack McConnell to become Labour leader and First Minister. Thanks for the honour. Let me say, I won't let you down. But he did just that. Why won't you say the figure, First Minister? His tenure was short-lived thanks to a scandal that became known as Officegate. What is important is that I take full personal responsibility. McLeish resigned after failing to declare income on subletting his Fife constituency office. Jack McConnell stepped in to steady the ship. 
Within months, he oversaw the introduction of free personal care for the elderly. The 2003 election produced a broad mix of parties and independent MSPs. The so-called Rainbow Parliament was led once again by a coalition of Labour and the Liberal Democrats. After years of controversy over its construction, MSPs moved into their new home here in Holyrood in 2004. An inquiry into the lengthy delays and spiralling costs criticised the management of the project, but it found no single villain of the piece. This was an issue that had dogged the early years of the Parliament. David McCletchy resigned as leader of the Conservatives after spending more than £11,000 on taxi fares. He was succeeded by Annabel Goldie. The wheels are back on the wagon and I'm the nag hitched up to tow it. Then came a moment as significant for devolution as it was for public health. Scotland became the first UK nation to ban smoking in public places, including restaurants and pubs. A radical change overcoming fierce opposition, a sign that Parliament had finally come of age. By the narrowest of margins, the SNP emerged the largest party in the 2007 election. Alex Salmond is selected as this Parliament's nominee for appointment as First Minister. Alex Salmond formed a minority government, overturning Labour's decades of long dominance of Scottish politics. It's my intention to tender my resignation to the Queen. The party also lost power at Westminster in 2010. David Cameron replaced Gordon Brown as Prime Minister, forming a coalition with the Liberal Democrats. Then in 2011... People talking about it being historic. Well, it seems uh, pretty reasonable. The SNP burst the electoral system, winning a majority of seats. It's not just Lanarkshire, it's not just Ayrshire, it's not just Glasgow, it's not just Edinburgh, it's Renfrewshire River, in fact, it's everywhere. It was a stunning victory, achieving what once seemed unthinkable. I'll govern for all of the ambitions of Scotland and all the people who imagine that we can live in a better land. And it paved the way for a vote on independence. After months of negotiations, Salmond and Cameron met in Edinburgh to agree the terms of a referendum on independence. The deal handed power to Holyrood to hold a vote with a single yes-no question. The result didn't go to plan for Salmond. The people of Scotland have spoken. Within hours, he stepped down as SNP leader and first minister. For me as leader, my time is nearly over. But for Scotland, the campaign continues and the dream shall never die. There was only one likely successor. I declare that Nicola Sturgeon is selected as this Parliament's nominee for appointment as First Minister. I will be First Minister for all of Scotland. Regardless of your politics or your point of view, my job is to serve you. The Marriage and Civil Partnership Scotland Bill is passed. Having approved a new law around a different kind of union, the first same-sex marriages took place in December. The SNP secured a third term in 2016, but lost its overall majority. The Conservatives, led by Ruth Davidson, leapfrogged Labour to become the second biggest party. Debate around the Constitution continued to dominate. Let June the 23rd go down in our history as our Independence Day. The UK's vote to leave the EU, despite a majority of Scots backing Remain, sparked fresh calls for a vote on independence. It is a significant and material change in circumstances. The option of a second referendum must be on the table. Now is not the time, came the repeated response from Westminster. Prime Minister. In the House of Commons, Prime Minister Theresa May repeatedly failed to get a Brexit deal passed. 
but with enormous and enduring gratitude to have had the opportunity to serve the country I love. She quit, with Boris Johnson taking over. Never mind the backstop, the buck stops here. Here, the former First Minister, Alex Salmond, was cleared of 12 charges, including attempted rape, following a trial in Edinburgh. Whatever nightmare I've been in over these last two years, it is as of nothing compared to the nightmare that every single one of us is currently living through. Hours later, the UK was put in lockdown as the COVID pandemic took hold. The coronavirus is the biggest threat this country has faced for decades. All over the world, we're seeing the devastating impact of this invisible killer. Following an address from the Prime Minister, Nicola Sturgeon announced strict measures to try to control the virus. Coronavirus is the biggest challenge of our lifetimes, and the measures we take to tackle it must reflect the magnitude of that. Plans for an independence referendum were paused as businesses closed and the nation was asked to stay at home. After the election in 2021, the SNP agreed a deal with the Scottish Greens, which saw them enter government for the first time. But the alliance failed to move on the debate on independence. The Scottish Parliament does not have the power to legislate for a referendum on Scottish independence. The Supreme Court dashed any hope of Holyrood holding a referendum without Westminster's consent. To all of the people of Scotland, whether you voted for me or not, please know that being your First Minister has been the privilege of my life. Nicola Sturgeon stunned the political world by announcing her resignation as First Minister and SNP leader. When you were Transport Minister, the trains were never on time. When you were Justice Minister, the police were strained to break breaking point. A bitter and fractious leadership race followed, with Hamza Youssef emerging the winner. To serve my country as First Minister will be the greatest privilege and honour of my life. Yusuf's time in office, though, was marked by controversy and policy reversals. Nicola Sturgeon, her husband Peter Murrell and former treasurer Colin Beatty were all arrested and released without charge. Mr Murrell, chief executive of the SNP for 22 years, has since been charged in connection with embezzlement from the party. Westminster blocked gender reforms while plans for highly protected marine areas and a deposit return scheme were also shelved. Then, after ditching climate targets and a pause on puberty blockers, Hamza Youssef ended the alliance with the Greens. The Butte House Agreement was intended to provide stability to the Scottish Government, and it has made possible a number of achievements, but it has served its purpose. His handling of the breakup was to cost him his position. Who does the First Minister think he is pleased most today? Is it Douglas Ross, Fergus Ewing or Alex Salmond? And more to the point, which of them does he think he can rely on for a majority in Parliament now? He quits before a vote of no confidence in his leadership. John Swinney took over unopposed, becoming Scotland's seventh First Minister. I offer myself to be the First Minister for everyone in Scotland. I am here to serve you. I will give everything I have to build the best future for our country. After 25 years, the Scottish Parliament is now well established as a dominant feature of Scottish life. Few could imagine being governed without it. And in that sense, it has been a success as an institution. But the past decade has seen Scottish politics riven by division. Most issues are now seen through the prism of the Constitution. Donald Dewar once said that devolution is a process, not an event. That process, the story of Scotland's Parliament, continues. To assess the record of devolution, we brought together three people who've all had big roles at Holyrood. The former SNP Cabinet Secretary Alex Neil, the former Conservative leader in Scotland Ruth Davidson, and the former Scottish Labour leader Kezia Dugdale. 
Alex, Kez, Ruth, thanks for joining us for this special look back at 25 years of the Scottish Parliament. Ruth Davidson, what do you think have been the biggest achievements of, of devolution in the last quarter of a century? Well, I think firstly, it's probably fair to say that in terms of where people look um, for their answers and for their politics now. The, the Scottish Parliament has surpassed the Westminster Parliament in so many areas because it's areas that really matter to people like education and health and all the rest of it. In terms of, of personal things for me, I, I think the biggest one was probably passing equal marriage um, and, and certainly being part of that debate and speaking about things in a way in a public space like I'd never done before and speaking about things in a manner for the first time and how exposing and how vulnerable that made me feel and then to see it passed. I think it's probably one of the more personal uh, achievements, that, that, sorry, one of the achievements of the parliament that has been more personal to me. Even now, um, you, even now I can see you're a little bit emotional about that one. Well, I think I'm stuttering over my words. But yeah, <laughs> I, mean, it, it was I was given the benefit of the doubt there. <laughs> Yeah, do you know, I, I, you know, it's after five o'clock. I probably started drinking, Colin. But um, you no, know, I mean, it, it really mattered. It, it mattered to me as a, as a gay woman, but it, it mattered to so many people out there who were gay, but 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 also those who weren't. About what kind of country we were and what kind of country we wanted to be. And uh, yeah, I, I think in terms of, I mean, I was only there ten years. Kez eight. You know, Alex has is, has is, been there for more than us put together. He can probably give you a longer view for his. I've been there longer than any of you. <laughs> Alex, yeah, that, exactly. Equal marriage. But, that was that was that, your that, legislation, that was wasn't thing. it? Yeah, I was the cabinet secretary who took it through, and I have to say, not just taking the bill through, but um, without blowing my own trumpet or Alex Salmon's, I think the way we handled that bill, uh, I was surprised when the gender recognition bill came before the parliament that the lessons of how to take a bill like that through the parliament were never learned, because we actually did it in such a way. We are sitting here ten years from now, and nobody would ever contemplate trying to reverse that legislation and yet at the time people said you know it would only last you know until the next regime came in and then they would change it all again uh, equal marriage is here to stay and we now actually have some churches who are thinking of doing it themselves what are the other big achievements because well, you as, as Ruth says you've been there the longest of the three of you I was there for 22 years and uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it but uh, I think we achieved quite a lot I mean for example free personal care which came in under uh, Henry McLeish and Henry had to fight the Labour cabinet in London as well as his own cabinet to get free personal care through and he did that and I think Henry deserves recognition for that. The smoking ban was Jack's uh, big thing. And then when Alec came in, there was a whole slew of changes, uh, particularly uh, the introduction of free tuition uh, for people at university, uh, I think was very important long term. But we also abolished prescription charges, we abolished the road tolls and all the rest of it. We had our road programme. You know, if you look at all the new roads built and initiated at that time in Scotland, it was a very considerable achievement. We boosted the housing programme substantially and we achieved a lot over a short space of time across a wide range of areas. Has he forgotten any cares? Or has he just listed them all? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I think there's quite a few we haven't covered yet and you think about the Parliament's 25 year history, for me the early albums were the best. So if the whole point of this institution was to do some of the big reforms Westminster didn't have the time to focus on for Scotland, the early legislation around housing, mental health legislation effectively yeah. closing asylums in Scotland and land reform and okay there's perhaps a lot more to do on that agenda but those early big substantive issues around reforming laws in Scotland, I think they were fundamental and often overlooked. Now, one of the things for me was that in the early days of the Parliament, everything was new. Yes. Everything was just exciting. But you were there as part of it. How exciting was it to be there, sitting in the chamber? It was very exciting, and particularly the day in which the Queen formally opened the Parliament for the first time. I mean, none of us will really have a day like that ever again. It and was probably a fantastic not a speech day. like Donald Dewar's either. Absolutely, it was an absolutely brilliant speech that Donald made. And it was so sad that we lost Donald so early in the Parliament because he was a great parliamentarian, he was a huge asset to the Parliament, and he, he actually delivered on things. For example, one of his pet projects was getting the national parks in Scotland. and that 
that legislation was introduced in the first four years. And we now have, I think it's three national parks in Scotland, all of which are a big asset for the country and for tourism. As the first First Minister, was he just the right person for the right job at the right time? I think he was. Um, having said that, the minute he became First Minister, the minute the Parliament was formed, the press all turned against us. Mind you, we didn't help things because David Steele... You gave yourself have... medals. Well, exactly. Well, it wasn't <laughs> Before you'd done anything. Well, it wasn't us. It was the presiding officer who'd done this. And, of course, we didn't know anything about it until it appeared in front of the national newspapers. But we also got a hell of a time over the building, you may remember. And I think that's where Donald... That was the one thing, I think, where Donald made a mistake. I think we should have done what the Welsh did and wait till the Parliament was elected before we initiated the construction of the new building. Kez, you were probably a student at that point. You were probably even still at school, weren't you? I was still at school. Yeah, don't, yeah. You're, you're making Alex and me feel old. But, I mean, <laughs> and even what, Ruth, just ever so slightly. Well, I'm, just, I'm sure Ruth was a student. <laughs> but what, 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 what's your me early memories of the Parliament then from that distance? So, so I was in fourth year at school when Labour came to power in 1997. So I was in fifth year in 98 and then um, obviously still in my final days of school when you were all getting elected yes. for the first time. And it was an exceptionally special moment, especially for a student of modern studies at the time. It did feel like something was shifting in the country, that there was a, a new beginning. And as Ruth said, it has become the central political institution in this yeah. country as a consequence. But Ruth, your party wasn't even in favour of it at the time. You, you would be old enough to vote at that time, though. I was. So the 97 election was my first time at voting that general election, which wasn't great for a Tory in Scotland, if you remember, and we lost every single seat. But it's character building, Colin. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so when I voted uh, in the referendum uh, for devolution, I'm probably one of the few people across Scotland that voted no, yes. In the, I, I didn't necessarily... So you voted against the Parliament, but yes for the tax powers? <laughs> Well, I, I figured that I, I didn't necessarily see the, you know, the potentiality that it could have. It was just a, another layer of politicians getting paid more money, thanks very much. But I thought that if we had to have one, we might as well give it the powers to go and do something. And, and I was always a bit surprised, actually, when those powers that were brought in by a referendum, those tax raising powers, were handed back by John Swinney without going back to get a mandate from the people because they'd only arrived with a mandate from the people and, and nobody seemed to, to, to worry about that deficit, which I always thought was odd. But but I think in terms of when I came into the parliament, you know, and, and I'd seen even from the very first piece of legislation, closing the ruddle loophole, so making it safer for people who had a particular um, problems and mental problems that had also committed crimes and could be dangerous and we were tidying up you, you kind of saw almost immediately what it could do as a reactive chamber as well as a proactive one it was quite important uh, and under my leadership we changed the official position of the Tories in Scotland which had been for the first sort of 10-12 years to be against its even existence to wanting to to, to, to wanting to keep it and also to wanting to make it really kind of get rocket boosters and, and work harder. Well, looking at it from the other perspective then, staying with you for a moment, Ruth, how hasn't it met people's expectations, do you think? Well, I think possibly there hasn't been enough imagination in, in policy making. Uh, one of my predecessors, David McCletchie, coined a, a nice line, which was uh, that, that the Parliament sort of traded in that which is not uh, banned shall be compulsory. And certainly in the early years, there was a lot of banning things and a lot of m either making things free or making them compulsory. Um, and, uh, you know, I I'm not sure that, that that's really um, as imaginative as it, as it could have been in terms of, of reforms. And the other thing, I, I think we we heralded the idea that it was going to be very consensual. It was going to be a semicircle of a chamber, so we wouldn't be across a dispatch box from each other, that we were going to be unicameral, so there wasn't going to be an upper chamber. We would have committees that would, would look at the legislation, both pre and post it being passed, about how well it worked, and that was all going to be independent, and we were going to scrutinise it fairly. And I'm not sure that the committee system has really lived up to billing, and I think that we've had some worse laws because of it. Um, yeah. I don't know how you reform it. I'm not entirely sure that anybody wants we'll a second chamber that. We'll come on to that. We'll come on to that. But we do need to make sure that we'll the laws that are passed are fit for purpose. We'll come on to that. But, I mean, consensus, Kez, there's a word from the past. Yes, and if I was to think about the mistakes that the Parliament has made over its history, I, I think, to a degree, I, I agree with Ruth that it's become far too easy to scrap things, to ban things and to give away things. Too much legislation. At the expense of um, reform. That's the one thing we, we haven't done. And part of that is because 10 of those 25 years were dominated by the constitutional issue, where it wasn't in the interest of political parties to upset the apple cart, right? Because reform requires big system change, big institutional change. It takes real leadership to get you through that end result. 
result. But we haven't done anything like the reforms that we, that we should have done, and, and we're paying the price for that now. We can see that in the public balance sheet. And in terms of the reforms, Alan, you know, one of the biggest ones that seems to have missed the boat every time is council tax. Absolutely. Council tax and business rates. And Jack McConnell actually set up a committee and it recommended a property tax. But a property tax is politically impossible to deliver. My own view is, and this is something I think the SNP should be looking at, if you look at the Danes, they have a land value tax. And they don't have business rates, they don't have council tax. The land value tax is a very This is something tax. that's been talked about in the Parliament exactly. for donkeys exactly. years. So nobody's ever done anything exactly. about it. Exactly, and there's far too much conservatism, small C in the Parliament. Another example And is not enough big C consensus exactly. to get anything done exactly. like that. Exactly, and land reform is another example of it. I mean, we've got a land reform bill, a more radical land reform bill this time, but it's not radical enough. And people were expecting much more. I mean, remember what Jimmy Maxton said a way back uh, from the ILP days. He said the Scottish Parliament would do more in five years than Westminster would do for Scotland in 25. And I I think despite the disappointments, that has been held true. We've done more in five times five years than they would have done in five times 25 years at Westminster. But the thing is, I mean, I suppose a lot of folk can't remember before devolution when, you know, you were lucky if there were two or three pieces of legislation a year at Westminster that even right. mentioned Scotland. Exactly, and a lot of things, like fuel duty reform, uh, one of the things we did early on in the Parliament was we got rid of the old feudal system in Scotland, and that was a radical reform that had been tried for over 100 years at Westminster and never got through. Let the case come in briefly. There's actually been far too much legislation, full stop, and we can see you're, now. You're following the Jack McConnell mantra here, do less better. No, aren't that's you? not what I'm saying at all. It's more about the fact that we now legislate for rights that can't be realised right across the spectrum from additional support needs, childcare, housing the treatment time guarantees. Yeah. There's a litany of things that are put into law that are utterly meaningless to citizens because there aren't the resources to back them up. And the, the scrutiny agenda of the parliament has failed. The child poverty targets are an example Climate of that. Change, and yeah. I was one of the ones involved in taking the bill through because it was a collective responsibility uh, decision. Uh, but my view is you set targets for child poverty. Uh, putting it into legislation is a con, quite frankly, because the, mm -hmm. the decision about child poverty is based on are you prepared to dedicate the resources is needed to solve child poverty or are you not? You don't need the legislation with targets which are not going to be reached anyway. What you need is the political will to actually do it. And for that you need some big personalities to, to, to derive that. Yes. Of the 349 MSPs over the 25 years, who stands out for you, Kez? Margot MacDonald, I mean, the relationship I had with her and um, the support that she gave me as a young politician coming into the parliament, even across the kind of party lines, yep, across the yep. constitutional divide, she was interested in people and, and, and encouraging them along and encouraging them to be brave. Uh, I'll remember her very, very fondly. Alex? Well, I would share that obviously Margot was a good friend of mine. Uh, I think also, to be honest, uh, Donald Dewar and Alex Salmon must go down in the history of two of the big characters. Unfortunately, he died early, but David McClatchy uh, was actually one of the best debaters in the Parliament, a great performer in the Parliament. With a great wit as well, early. didn't he? Great wit. And he was one of these characters. He was a very, very able guy, very good debater. And also, you could talk to David. You could do a deal with David. You knew he would keep it. Um, and we did that with him and with Annabel Goldie as well, the f first time we were a minority government. Uh, whereas we did a deal with the Greens on a budget, and at five to five, five minutes before the vote, <laughs> they pulled out. So you couldn't trust them an inch. Whereas David McClatchy and Annabel Goldie the, we could trust. So these were, in Scottish terms, big characters, but the two outstanding ones in terms of First Ministers, anyway, I think are Alex Salmond and Donald Dewar, two, and ob two big characters. Obviously, you three are part of the big characters Absolutely. in Hollywood as well. Ruth Davidson, who's your big characters? Who stands out for you over the 25 years? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily disagree with anything that Alex or uh, or Kezia have said, but I, I think parliaments also work by by grafters as well as yeah. big characters. And one of the the, the um, people that that was picked out there by Alex was David McCletchy, a, a former Scottish Tory leader that then went on to be a, a chief whip that did some of the deals. I would actually put Bruce Crawford on that as yeah. somebody that yeah. got things done. Uh, so lots of people out there probably won't really know his name. Although he was back in the parliament in just parliament the other day. Yes. Yeah, he was yeah, back yeah. in the parliament and, and just the other day trying to help them out, I think. Yeah, in terms of somebody that got stuff done, who knew everyone, that played with a straight bat, who's... Oh, I think we've lost you, know, you there. You, right. oh, no, you froze there for a moment. You could talk it through. You know, he absolutely... You know, he, he wasn't one for big speeches, but, my God, that Parliament got things done, and Alex Hammond wouldn't have 
passed half the stuff he did in a minority government if it wasn't for Bruce Crawford. Let's look ahead. Where do you think the Parliament needs to go next, Ruth? I think it has to look at the committee system. Now, this is something we've been talking about for 20 years, but it doesn't work. It doesn't work well enough. There are some committees that do excellent work. I would say the Petitions Committee, we've seen some brilliant stuff. That's where members of the public come before MSPs and they try and bring areas of interest forward and they become they can become legislation. We've seen stuff with the MESH scandal. Alex will talk to you about that. He was you know, in, you know, integrally involved in helping women that had had terrible things done to them. That started from a member of the public. But in terms of the scrutiny of legislation, it is not working. It has not worked. Nobody thinks it works and nobody wants to blow apart the consensus and, and give up their wee bit of fighting over things and making political points. And actually, we'd all be better off if we, we sorted it out. Alex. I agree with that, uh, what Ruth has just said about scrutiny in the committee system, but I think other fundamental reforms required. I mean, for example, in the committee system, we should be electing the conveners of committees, not have them appointed effectively by party leaders. Right again, from why haven't we done that already, given that, again, people because have been talking about it for so long? Because ever since day one, uh, the party whips and the business managers across party work together, and the power in the par internally in the parliament is concentrated so control. on the fr control freakery by all the parties, uh, and that has been bad news for the Parliament. You know, the founding principles of the Parliament, the four founding principles are openness, transparency, accountability and shared power. We are not abiding by any one of those principles the way the Parliament is now working, and we need to actually do that. The other big change I would make is, you know, let's keep a proportional representation system, but let's have STV instead of this pernicious list system, which gives the party hierarchies even more control over who becomes an MSB. Now, in the Doyle in Ireland, they have an STV system, and at the present time, despite STV, they've got 10 independent members, the Margo McDonald's, the Dennis Canavans, and we need people like that in the Parliament to keep the parties on their toes and keep them democratic. And he's talking about single transferable vote, no us. Um, <laughs> what's your hopes for the future, Kez? Three things for me stand out. Um, more powers, more MSPs, more scrutiny. So the fiscal framework isn't working. I think there's an unanswerable case now to yeah. devolve employment law and immigration powers to a degree to address some of the challenges that Scotland faces. We've increased the powers of the Parliament so far, but not the number of MSPs in it. We don't have strong enough backbenches. There are too many people in government. There's a whole structural bit of work there around how the Parliament functions. Wales have just increased their numbers of Assembly yeah. members. Scotland needs to look at that. And finally, more scrutiny, so less legislation, a, a reflection on 25 years of the laws that we've passed and a, a hard, a cold look at, at what we've passed and whether it's actually working for the people of Scotland. I'm well, going to give, uh, give Kessie an SNP card. I'm just waiting for saying she's I in favour of I think somebody might have tried that I'm already, Alex. What's that got to do with the SNP? <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Colin, but there's a point I'm here, right? Briefly. No, no, a really brief point. Briefly. Where have the devolutionists gone? They're, the vast majority of people in this country want a parliament that works for them. It's got nothing to do with independence right. at all. <laughs> and I'm going to have to stop you there. Thank you all for joining us for what is a historic discussion of a historic event. Absolutely. Covered a lot of ground, but that's all from this Scotland Tonight special. We leave you with Sheena Wellington's stirring rendition of A Man's A Man For All That from the opening of the first Scottish Parliament in 1999. Here's one last thing. Today will be lovely to start with before...